Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Stewart Observatory. And welcome to those of you watching us on the World Wide Web via iTunes U. This evening, we have a very special presentation. But before uh, I introduce tonight's speakers, uh, I have a couple of announcements. Sadly, it's too cloudy for observing. So the Raymond D. White Junior Telescope will not be open this evening for viewing. However, there will be a reception at the conclusion of tonight's lecture over in the main lobby of Stewart Observatory. If you are a student who is here for an assignment, I am the person who will validate your assignment. Come to, I'll be up at the table in the back, and I will stamp your notes to prove that you are here. <laughs> Finally, since I won't be talking at the end of tonight's presentation, I'd like to remind you that two weeks from tonight, we do not have a steward public event because on Friday, April 9th, we have the Mark Aronson Memorial Lecture. There will be Dr. David Kirkpatrick from California Institute of Technology. That will be in this room at 7.30 on Friday night. We meet Friday night instead of Monday night that week, uh, April 9th. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the director of the History National Observatory, Dr. Buell Dune. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the University of Arizona for providing the venue uh, for tonight's events. Before we get, begin our program, I'm going to take a few minutes to explain how this particular event fits in to our overall 50th anniversary celebration. I get off, often asked over the last two years, which 50th are we celebrating now? <laughs> in, in 2007, as we approached the celebration of the 50th anniversary, of the creation of the Association Associated Universities of Research and Astronomy, really took off the tongue, or ORA, the group that runs the National Observatory, or the National Science Foundation, the group that provides the funding for the National Observatory, which is part of the federal government. A group of us at the National Observatory realized that it was going to be very difficult to design a single anniversary event that would include all the communities that deserve the chance to celebrate with us. So we set on the idea of having a series of events that would begin close to the anniversary of the selection of 50 Rudolf and Roth as the site, and end, round now, corresponding to the anniversary of the dedication of the site in 1960. And in between was the International Year of Astronomy. So since starting around uh, 2008 through the present, we've had a series of events. Now, the original dedication of Kid Peak was the culmination of years of work by Aiden Mile and his colleagues working for Laura and the NSF and with the support of the Tomahawk of Nation to create a national facility for optical astronomy, a facility that would be distinctive in being available to researchers with the best ideas as reviewed by their peers. The land that has been sacred to the Tawamaku people for centuries, we now study how the universe has evolved for billions of years. And for this opportunity provided by the nation, we are very grateful. <coughs> Subsequent to the founding of Kipti, Aura and the NSF worked with collaborators in the South, the University of Chile, and the then director of the Chilean National Observatory, <coughs> Federico Rutland, to develop the Sarah Paloma Inter-American Observatory a facility that has grown and flourished over the years and set our community on a path that has seen the continuing development of international observatories in Chile. Together, Kidpeak National Observatory, Cerro Tololo, and the solar facilities on Sacramento Peak in New Mexico were the initial stages of what has become the National Optical Astronomy Observatory and the National Solar Observatory, both of which are headquartered across the street in the building across Cherry Island. Today, we continue to find collaborators to develop a system of facilities that all astronomers will use to continue their research programs in the years ahead. We are celebrating today not only the dedication of Fit Peak as a facility, but also the concept and future of the National Observatory, open to all based on their merit. The talks tonight by our first director, Dr. Aidan Milo, and Bernard Sekreris from the Tawanaki Nation 
That was a culmination of a series of events we have held over the past two years, and I would like to briefly highlight a few of them. In 2008, we held the most recent of an ongoing series of open houses for the people of the Alpha Nation. These events are a chance to share what is done at the observatory with the people of the nation, and for them to share their culture with us. And this event had over a thousand people in September 2008, by far the largest of these open houses we've had, and we look forward to having one in the future. In October of last year, we hosted a group of artists from the International Association of Astronomy Artists. They were actually in residence, and they interacted not only with the visitors to the mountain and local communities, but also with the Focal Center Museum that uh, Bernard is the education curator for, uh, South of Cells. And I'm pleased to say that some of the artwork, I think, is here tonight, maybe, maybe not. It might be in, in the back. Last November, we held a reunion for former and current staff. This was a chance for those that founded and developed the observatory over the years to remember and to inspire those of us that still work for NOAA and NSO. And in preparation for this event, John Glasby led a, a, very, a large group of, well, a small crack team of people find pictures and movies of the early days of Fit the Against the Tarot. And you saw some of John's hard work in the slideshow he was showing. Um, as you came in. So last week, uh, we were also very pleased to have 150 researchers come from all over the country to share with us their research topics. Uh, how some of that was how they use our facilities to further their own research and to look to the future. But tonight, what brings us together is looking back a little bit of the past. And we are fortunate to have two distinguished speakers from whom we will learn about the role of the Golden Blog, Dick Peak, as it's known for most of us, plays in the history and culture of the Fall of the People and in the creation of the National Observatory. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Helmut Apt, one of the Observatory's earliest scientific staff members and longtime editor of our most preeminent uh, scientific journal, the Ethical Journal, to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Jules. Introducing Aiden Lionel is a real challenge because there are very few people who have accomplished so much in so many diverse fields. Aiden was born and raised in Pasadena, California, which was an ideal place for a young person because of all the facilities around there. As a high school student, he read his brother's college chemistry book cover to cover. He went to, to the the Huntington Library, where he read Newton's books in, in original versions. He also worked in the summers at Mount Hill's Nautical Shop, and he also volunteered uh, on some millimeter wave uh, experiments on Mount Logan. After a year of oh, then he met his future wife, Marjorie, uh, at Pasadena City College, and she convinced him to give up his promising career as a chemist to go into science. <laughs> After a year at Pasadena City College, he transferred to Caltech. When World War II started, uh, he joined the Caltech Rocket Project. He was soon designing launchers for rockets and developed a multiple rocket launcher. He taught Marines at Camp Pendleton how to launch uh, rockets. He designed a multi-stage solid propellant rocket, which were launched from their friend. When drafted, he was assigned uh, by the Navy to work at China Lake. He determined the timing of fuses, uh, which are needed for determining at what elevation bombers should fly. <laughs> then, as an expert on rockets, he was sent to Europe uh, near the end of World War II to learn uh, about the German V2 rockets and how they were made. He went to Jena, uh, which before the Russians arrived there, because it was on the east side of the LV, and he visited the recently bombed out Zeiss factory. He found 
Surprisingly, amongst all the scattered paper drawings, he found a, a document signed by Hitler, who was in the document specified the five most important rocket projects that the that Germans would uh, were engaged in. Then he went to Nordhausen, where the B2 rockets were built. Uh, and he learned there that they had plans for a two stage of uh, B2 rockets that could reach the United States. <clears throat> he found uh, several cruise or wing missiles, so they had developed cruise missiles already. Then he was sent to Austria, <coughs> where the Germans were testing underwater rockets in the deep lake called Copeland Bay. But their attempts had not been conveyed uh, because the parts for the rockets had been bombed and transported. In, in Europe, he met members of the Alsace mission, uh, in particular, George Elder, who was the president. <coughs> that he was a top naval rocket expert. He didn't even have the best to do. He invited go to European tech after we were on. However, he even went to UCM University to finish their bachelor's degree and PhD. He designed and built an extremely fast spectrographic camera and obtained spectra of Aurora from Northern Lights and the air flow. He proved that the Aurora were produced by photons coming from the sun. He resolved uh, and then identified some of the air glow victims, including what is now called the vinyl OH band. He was also a key person in the planning for the International Geophysical Year, uh, which was 1957-58, and convinced them that they should have a station for South Pole. At Jerky's then, he was the associate director of the Strongman. He started an optical shop to build F1 cameras and uh, work together with Morgan uh, so to use the F1 cameras to photograph H2 regions in the Milky Way. He also started to design large telescopes. He was a natural choice to search for sites for the National Optical Observatory. <coughs> uh, because air travel in the mid 50s, for the first time, allowed astronomers in any major city in the country to fly to any other major city in one day. Previous to that, it would take four or five days to cross the country in a, in a train. So it was an opportune time to think of having a national observatory for all the astronomers in the country to use. Uh, he acted for a committee headed by Dr. Robert Arnold Nath, but he searched for and test the central site. The testing involved measuring the scene and he developed the unique design for that in which he let the image of Claire that moved around in a small circle pass through a rocky screen uh, and uh, to a photomultiplier. And then uh, this equipment was put at the top of a large uh, tower to get away from ground seeding. Aiden's design for the what is called the 80 inch telescope, later called the 2.1 meter, was very novel. It involved the fastest primary that had ever been made for a large telescope, and that's because he developed a technique for testing the figure of a fast <laughs> primary. Uh, so the primary was F2.7, and therefore the passing range could be F8. The primary was made by a slumping or remelting process, uh, and it didn't have a honeycomb back. Because of the homogeneous nature of the pilot in this uh, <coughs> slumping process, uh, John Loomis could uh, grind, polish, and figure the primary <coughs> in 15 months. Meanwhile, seeing and transparency tests were conducted uh, for two years together with consideration of uh, other factors, and these uh, led to the selection of the site for Kitty, and Aiden became the first director. Aiden will tell us about that. The observatory grew and teacher uh, 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 supervised and 
discussed in the large solar telescope. In 1960, Abe went to the University of Arizona and was director of the Student Observatory after Carpenter in year four or five. Aiden and Frank Lowe designed the multiple mirror telescope. Aiden knew about all the optical blinds that Florence had stashed away in the factory in the backyard and knew that there were six 1.5 meter blinds kind of sitting there, and those were used for the multiple mirror telescope. Aiden then started the Optical Sciences Center, one of the two uh, universities in the country that ran PhD. In optics, the other being the zero system. It had, it had since had on its staff the only two Nobel Prize winners in Arizona. This, that center and the students it produced started the optical industry in that area. Along the way, he embarked to explore solar energy, although the technology was not yet developed to make that economical. Following that, Aiden went to JPL. I don't know what they did there. <laughs> Perhaps some of it is still classified. <laughs> For instance, he knew uh, what was happening in Area 51 in Nevada. And was even a wild man. It since was uh, recently declassified. He could tell you about that. But I know that he became the national expert on the resolution on the ground that should be obtained from aircraft and spacecraft. And so when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred, he was called to Washington to assess his nuclear rockets. So uh, let's now listen to his description of the development of the Cuban National Territory. Uh, those of you that are aware of what goes on in Area 51 uh, in Nevada may have heard of one of them, it's called Oxcar. The fastest airplane ever designed that I had a little bit to say about it during a meeting because at the CIA you have to take a name. Well, it's the fastest. And I, I just innocently said, well, I know the slowest vehicle. <laughs> and I have been gathered them in India. It's called an ox cart. And then everyone said, that's it. <laughs> so it became ox cart. Well, <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit more about why Kitt Peak was selected when everybody now knows a much better science. The NSF was making the grants and partially from new telescopes for astronomy departments. These key options were addressed at Flagstaff meeting that you just heard referred to. They were already funding them with 36 inch telescopes for various departments. And that was the option favored by many departments because they wanted their own telescopes. And 36 inch was big enough to do a lot of research with. The other was that made the inch accessible to individual observers. And this was advocated by Leo Goldberg and Robert R. McMahon. The NSF favored the option for 
and not letting it to the National Optical Instrument Observatory at Mullins. So you may wonder, how did I get involved? Well, I think you've already gathered that I got in lots of things during my lifetime, <laughs> mainly because I I've never learned to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, Buell. I'm trying to. This thing is kind of slow to respond. Okay. Are you adjusting the volume? Okay. The, yeah, I'm adjusting the volume. Okay. The NSF decided first on the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO. An aggregator class sterile dish antenna was being considered. But it was too expensive for a single observatory. And better to provide access to all radio astronomers. But it had restrictions on it, just like I'll tell you about restrictions on finding a site if you came to think. First, it should be close to East Coast radio astronomers, and thus close to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and part of that was they wanted it to have to travel down one hour from Washington, D.C. And the reason was that the big antenna was being pushed by the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. Well, NUI was selected to implement this plan for very large storable fish. It's like aura. It's an organization to accept funding from the government and carry out things that the astronomers want. Well, Mark Fox and I were regents on the board of AUI. Well, how did I get on the board of regents of a place like that? That's a long story. Of it. it goes all the way back to the radio operator that guided Admiral Byrd across his flight of the pole. And that radio operator was Lloyd Murphy. So Mark Bach and I were selected to do a site survey. So I, now I'm getting my feet wet. Well, we already had a lot of data on it. And we recommended a site at Green Bank, West Virginia. The word in fact. <laughs> well, the NSF wanted recommendations on the National Optical Astronomy Research Project. <laughs> and as I said, they already were supporting it for individual university and the larger telescope. And McMath was asked to form an ad hoc committee to make recommendations. And a contract was given to the University of Michigan. I was selected to be executive secretary. Now that doesn't sound like much. There was a key position because I prepared the agendas and I wrote the recommendations for action. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I never had an official position. <laughs> it just happened. And all of the men that worked with me, and there's quite a few of them sitting in here, none of us had official titles. We just did what was necessary. And it was a lot of fun, wasn't it, guys? <laughs> well, my role with AUI and Green Bank may have been. But I don't really know. <laughs> so that's a crazy life that I have to live. But Ben Stronger was one of the McMath panel, didn't know what I was doing on the net, finding the site for the National Radio Observatory. 
I'm pretty sure that my experience of NAR was a factor, but I don't know. This is the invasion of the Jack Stone and the commander of the Mass Panel, and he knew about my role with the AUR. And I wrote a brand new book from the Executive Secretary, which I don't know what I was supposed to do, but it was ad hoc through the site survey and through everything that followed, like the design of the building, the telescopes and support facility, and on their completion, I was served one year. That's great. That was an honor for me, but I'd already informed them and President Harville of the university that I wanted to move across the street here. Some of my astronomer friends said that my lifetime of interest in the project was about three years. <laughs> <laughs> but I just pretty well kept up. But that's just the way it the way it was. Ed Carpenter invited me over here. So I joined the University of Arizona. And now I'm prepared prepared this report to describe the site survey and in particular why it was chosen. Well we have a lot of site constraints put on us as a team here. It was highly constrained on practical consideration. It had to be at the lower southwest latitude within the continental United States. It's left out Hawaii and uh, Mexico. And lots of beautiful sites that now have telescopes on them. But the southwest was presumably out of phase with the weather affecting the California Observatory. We found it wasn't really that much out. This was the real constraint. It couldn't be any higher than 8,000 feet. <coughs> because astronomers can't live and sleep at 9,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and the living quarters down here hadn't dawned on them yet. <laughs> <laughs> No one not expected to be affected by nearby city lights or into arbitrary came up 50 years. <laughs> and we're at that 50 year point now. <laughs> but this is a key ease of access by visiting astronomers. And the mean of these attractive to the role of staffings and families. Those become extremely important. Especially when you do your measurement of the scene, you find that all the sites are about the same. So, this limited oyster now still in southern Arizona, New Mexico. And here's a map of the region. One was at Wallafi, it was started by a rail train of the Santa Fe. And had a nice highway close by. Summit, which was another one up in the, the region, high enough above the Flagstaff plateau to be above the night chilled air. And the surprise was Chevron Butte that Alma Pat and I discovered while driving along a muggy on the rim and looking out across the plateau. Hey, there's a, a nice plateau. And we drove over there, got up on it, and thought that would be a nice observatory site. So that's how we selected these. And of course, Kit Peak, which was distinctly now, we found no really good sites in, in between because of the dominance of Phoenix, the interior map. <coughs> Unipero, well, here's Lincoln's other than Palomar. Unipero Sarah brought back, and I followed up all of this, a dramatic occasion because an amateur had a 20 inch telescope up there. 
and I saw the most magnificent scene I have ever seen in my life. The detail on Mars is without opposition now. It just would have defied ever doing it with a drawing. But you will notice it is practically on the edge of a cold ocean covered with fog. And that's the secret of many of the observatories, especially down in Chile. You want a nice cold ocean so that you don't have rising thermals <laughs> and then turn it nice observing on your side. But that was ruled out because it was in California. <laughs> that was politically unacceptable. <laughs> So this is what I think is so good about this. <coughs> well, there's all of the sites that come from. It shows what we weren't aware of, that a Pacific storm track would pass over the northern Arizona sites. So we have essentially the same weather a day or two afterwards. The Kit Peak was far enough south to be less effective. <coughs> but you heard of monsoon season. <laughs> some years you have it, some years you don't. But Kit Peak is far enough south that it's in the circulation network and in your summer thunderstorm. So there's a trade off. So that was where we were at. I had some pictures of the northern sites. This is the Wallapai sites. It's the cluster of mountains off to the extreme right. Now that would have been okay for a 180 inch and maybe a 36 inch, but not the way it reaches today. This is summer which is south of Bill and Lee's mountain. It has a reasonable amount of area on it that couldn't possibly hold much more than a 36 inch and maybe 4 inch. <laughs> Chevron Butte has an extensive plateau region that would be accessible and you see the long length of it with a little notch at the end of the power pole in the middle. And that notch between them is a narrow notch that goes to the top and is far more and up. And the rancher said, two men with rifles can fend off any number of lawmen. Because <laughs> 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 that became the site for the Russian cattle. So you see, that had quite a bit of, of space. The southern side, Kent Peak, had an extensive southern region that Helmer Mack discovered on his first flight over it when he was looking at the farthest west range of high mountains and came back and reported that it had an extensive southern region that could accommodate multiple telescopes, and it had. So Helmer, that spotting that really opened it the view to something to the south. This is one of my favorite pictures, the first picture I took, before there was any development at all in the Peak. Uh, the village of Pantai is right in the middle foreground. But it was an isolated mountain. But remember, there's no roads, no trails or anything up there. How could we get up there to even test it? The money that NSF provided for us was totally inadequate. So this site offered the protection of the tribal reservation from expansion of the south of the west. And it quickly became the focus of attention by the now panel, because it seemed to meet all of the requirements. Especially ease of access and the like. And I just wonder 
What would have been the history of this area and where you were sitting if Kid Creek had not been selected, but had gone somewhere else? If this has been a tremendous stimulus, not only to astronomy here, but optical sciences that I'm especially proud of. But that's another three year program. <laughs> <laughs> The access to the mountain was blocked by any vehicle. Also, it had a name by the old gentleman that kept the calendar stick with its notches in it to keep the records of it because he called it Home of the Cloud. It was from that village. The first clouds of summer appeared to just sprout out of the summit of the peak. You couldn't see that with Hickory because it's hidden there. So it was home of the cloud, and he blocked us from even setting foot on the mountain until a fortunate for us, unfortunate for him, he died. And we soon got <coughs> Yes, I remember that past reaction when I told him what the name of the was. He said, Don't know who put that in the report. <laughs> <laughs> so it offered the university for the independent focus of attention. But there were three problems. No access to the mountain was blocked, as I said. No access by any vehicle. And I have already mentioned the potential embarrassment here. The invitation was finally granted, and we were invited by the tribe to be their guests to go up. On the height on the thing. Limited funds, of course, is a basic problem. The Herman Thompson got to the Cavity Highway Commission, and they offered us the use of their heavy duty construction equipment. You see, it's a one to one deal where you can get things done when you don't have the money to do it. Okay. But the project was only paid to operators. We figured that was as good as the orders we could have. The rough trail was built, bulldozed up from the summit up the steep eastern side. It had a maximum slope of track of grade of 100%, 45 degrees. And he wanted an exciting ride in that <coughs> trailer behind it, a tractor towing you up the mountain. That I, I know. <coughs> no possibility of this being often. I can remember some astronomers that were on the committee that would not ride in that trailer. They were such a hike up the trailer. <laughs> but the 16 inch telescope and the test tower were hauled up over this very steep trail. A general access was done, and Carl Thompson and the county got a 27% grade. The public access road was prohibitively expensive, but it would cost that house. It would cost more than the entire observatory funded by NSF, which at that time was only $3 million. But the McMahon panel soon decided that Kit Creek was the most important site. We have a short movie about this first and second. Is that okay. Are okay. they opposite? No. This is leading to the sign. Going to old to the sign. Let's <laughs> 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 Beautiful drive out here across the desert. We soon learned in the first summer 
that you can have a downpour of rain many miles away and suddenly come upon the river flowing. I hit that with my jeep, fortunately the bottom of it was nice and smooth, and I skidded across. <laughs> <laughs> so we're now traveling up as guests of the tribe. Those were two shots home that got in there by some reason. You saw the the grapefruit. So when I tried to go up on foot, there was no water on the mountain. So we took grapefruit along as our source of water. Well, I didn't make it all the way to the top. But tell me, you didn't, did you? You got short, too. You know, your, your leg muscles get out on you. <laughs> I was preparing a poem sometime near the summer. And you may see the picture here where we have the fireplace. And you soon may learn that where you stand in the totem pole of the tribe, horses come first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the first thing that gets water in the, the summer were the horses. Then, without a meter out or anything, they dumped some coffee in it. <laughs> what was left? They put it on the fire, and we had our coffee. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> So we did explore around enough to get a feeling that there was a large area that could be developed there. And I took a lot of pictures of the different regions that were useful in the analysis of <laughs> And climbing rocks with cowboy boots. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then I struggled up to try to do it too. I at least got sitting at the top of the summit and the feet were now the four major colors but the one thing. Well on the way down, my horse slipped on a stretch of rock. The horse went down, and I unfortunately went up. So all I had was a broken hand. But the horse wasn't harmed because it stopped in the chaparral farther down. But we were very happy that it looked like an on the ground inspection that it had a great potential for not only the first two telescopes, but Anything within reason that astronomers wanted to know. I think that we can do it now. Oh, oh that was it. Oh, can I move on? Okay. There's the fire, and there's the fire. Eating the hard coffee. <laughs> We aren't really smiling. <laughs> but it was so nice to see that beautiful starry sky over the hill. And I took pictures off in the distance as we go all over the peaks of the area. So I accomplished that purpose. But that was the first night on the peak. Now, <laughs> Elma mentioned the test towers, and this is one of the test towers, and there's a group of us uh, there. 
the automatic polaris telescope was at the top. The inner structure was 50 feet above the ground and it consisted of two concentric structures. The first one that carried the instrument was protected by an outer tower that was additional strengthening of the cables, you can see. Then we had problems with it. And all four sites essentially showed the same seeing exercise. And pressure amounted mounted to make a decision when you get on the hill, the National Astronomical Observatory on Jet B. So that's how it got selected. It wasn't a long, carefully measured thing. It was considered a practicalities of a support city with a university, with an international airport, with rail service, with good schools, almost everything that you could want to make a good site for an observatory, plus a well-protected one to the west on what was really when you get up top, like the first time, you felt like you were on a mountain in the midst of the desert. Just an isolated view. You have a wonderful feeling of the action. So the key factors were the relative isolation of the rail service, the community for city offices, and the university offered a city site for the uh, city office, housing and schools for the Tucson staff. That was a very important one to fit in there. For the lease, it started negotiations very early 